what up ladies and gentlemen um i'm mm -hmm. here with guitarist singer whatever you want to call it songwriter of the legendary cult shoegaze i guess fuzzy band um lsd in the search for god it's mr andy litz i got that right right is it andy litz uh list you don't pronounce the z list oh okay, awesome got you got it man well um how are you how's life I'm good. I'm, uh, yeah, life is, life is pretty good right now. How about yourself? It's going good. I mean, I get to interview all these awesome bands and yeah, it's cool what you're doing, man. Appreciate it. So, um, the first thing you probably like expected this question, but the first question that's on my mind and everyone's mind is it's been almost eight years since the last EP. Are we going to get some more stuff? Yeah, we're, uh, working on some stuff right now we've been playing a couple of new songs two new songs mostly and uh we've been playing live recently sometimes you know not always but um but yeah you you, you definitely will awesome <laughs> is there any like specific direction you're taking this or is it more like a um like you're building on it every show and just screwing around with it no i mean they're they're the way they're being you know tracked out might sound somewhat differently than live but um no we, we have i mean it's pretty much set and ready to go we actually did a bunch of tracking in about 2019 or so um and then we'll probably you know we're planning on just scrapping most of that and we've been redoing it so we'll we'll probably redo that but um yeah no the songs are are you know we have a number of songs that are ready to go and just you know need need some time and, and some attention but um yeah they're they're for the, for the most part they're feeling pretty ready so beautiful um that's makes 2024 a little better you know super awesome, exciting so we're excited too <laughs> <laughs> great and you know that it'll get all the support and whatever because we're hungry we're hungry yeah, um so you know your your top song is starting over it's a hell of a track it's the track that got me into your music that got my friends into your music that I'm sure got, you know, a lot of your fans into your music are, uh, do you want another track like starting over that got that popularity or is it something that you're not really yearning for? Interesting question. I think, um, you know, whatever happens with it will be, you know, it's, it's obviously it's wonderful. Um, you know, it's nice to get attention and appreciation and it's also what can help drive it and, you know, continue to make it possible. But I think that, uh, you know, starting off doing this, I mean, it's, it's not surprising to me or to us that people, I mean, you know, we, it means something <laughs> to us and it resonates to us. And, um, it's something we believe in, but the, the goal was never, um, you know, anything other than, um, expressing ourselves and, and, and presenting, you know, our music and, and doing it in a way that makes sense. And um, so, yeah, and I like the same, I guess I would say the same thing is that there's, there's really no, the, the goal or expectation really isn't something that goes into it when it's being written. And it's certainly not something that goes into it when it's being recorded. And maybe that expectation is certainly something that people on the business side might have or record labels might have, but um, no, I, you know, I, it'd be, It'd be wonderful if it resonates, you know, with people like some of our other stuff has. And if, you know, and if it doesn't, that's okay too. But it's, um, yeah, ultimately our, you know, certainly speaking for myself, but I think, our, you know, our goals and motivation have much more to do with expressing, you know, uh, the music and, and our, you know, our experience of life and letting that happen and then letting, letting the other chips sort of just fall where they may. Right. And awesome I guess philosophy, right? You know, the go with the flow, which I've seen with a lot of people, but that's nice. Then not everything is so um, cut out. And speaking of your experiences, right? The the band came up in a really, I guess, weird time for music because you you're it's like the MySpace yeah. era, and yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, um, how do you think that really influenced your sound? Because we've seen, you know, we've seen the other shoegaze bands are kind of more seasoned acts and they're kind of older, or whatever, and then. Whereas with you guys, you came up in the in MySpace area and the in the um early social media. It's a weird place, you know. Yeah, and I think um maybe the kind of music that we were presenting wasn't quite as in vogue as it is at the moment. But you know, similar similar to the last 
question in a sense was it was um you know it wasn't a marketing ploy or a marketing scheme or you know we didn't sit around with ourselves or with um you know marketers and try to figure out the best kind of music to present that might grab people it was something that um you know really moved me and something that felt like was you know coming and flowing through that and and um trying to just you know ex express what was happening and what i was feeling and um but yeah no it, it was definitely an interesting time in terms of how how that time affected the sound you know i i don't know how much if that really had a whole lot to do with the sound other than um you know there were plenty of influences and things i listened to that were very inspiring to me that probably shaped somewhat of the sound but um you know, and I think now it is interesting, like you said, with just, you know, having the internet for this much longer. And um, I think it's easier perhaps to find any kind of, you know, any genre or even outside of music to find things that are that are more niche or maybe more difficult to get from a mainstream stream standpoint. Those things are in some ways more accessible in all kinds of ways. And, um, you know, and of course, that was started to be the case around the time of uh, MySpace. It was also that was the first time when I suppose people were somewhat more accessible than they had been in the past if they had MySpace pages. And it was, in some ways, it's interesting. It was really, it was in some ways easy to um, make a community um, in ways that were more difficult. I mean, I think, you know, moving away from personal meeting and that kind of stuff is, is never necessarily a good thing. But at the same time, complementing that with being able to reach people, you know, from parts of the world that you might not normally be able to do as well or um like i said find music that might not typically be being you know pushed or promoted in certain ways that if you're seeking looking for something it was easier to find but um so that was really interesting i don't know that the time necessarily you know affected our sound per se or what we were doing um but i do think you're right i mean it's interesting to look back at the at those myspace days i mean that was yeah. you know that was my art most people's, but certainly our our first foray into this whole social media kind of thing, and um, you know, and and what that entails as, a, you know, an individual as well as a band. I mean, that was definitely it was the wild, wild west, so to speak, at the time. That's for sure. I know it's, social media is such a a weird, weird thing, and to be in this age where like um, Maddie Beatty or M Matthew Beatty of another band I interviewed, um, he sent me like Italian death metal like with mm -hmm. jazz so like the beginning is all jazz and then it just gets more and more death metal there's no way i would have been able to find you know or he would have been able to find that or no you can't find that kind of stuff just right. snooping around or whatever right. like at record stores too whenever i'm at my local record store i can't listen to that can record you know right. you right. gotta it's almost like a, a you're you're jumping head first but in the same way that's kind of a good thing isn't it like radical exploration of yourself with like maybe 20 bucks that's like the best exploration exploration of yourself you can get for 20 bucks no it's pretty it's, it's pretty fascinating and then of course um yeah i mean you know the old days when you would go to the i mean i what i would do when i was your age i mean the, the gatekeepers besides maybe if you're lucky enough to have someone's older brother or sister who listens to this stuff and you know turns you on to that but um one of the biggest you know, gatekeepers at that time was, you know, 120 minutes on MTV and, you know, getting out of VCR videotape and, either, you know, staying up and watching it, but also videotaping it as well. So you could go back through and taking notes while you're watching it and then waiting at the, you know, back then it was Tuesdays when new, record, new music would come out. So then um, waiting until Tuesdays to figure out what was happening and go get stuff. And there was a, um, I, excuse me, let me turn this off here. Um, I wonder if I can make that not happen. Um, but yeah, there's a, you know, and then there was a great indie, in the you know, independent music store in Minneapolis where I grew up. With a, not there anymore, called Northern Lights, where it was always really fun to take that twenty bucks and, you know, voyage down to uh, to the record store on Tuesdays and uh, have enough money to, and then you know, not other than like I said, hundred and twenty minutes or other kinds of things, but not really having an opportunity to really preview things like you can now and uh, taking a leap on, a, you know, maybe there's 10 records that you want to get and you 
got enough money for one or two and uh you know combination of artwork and things that maybe you've already heard or um maybe location of where they're from and other bands that you like and, and kind of going for it i mean that's that was a pretty magical time you know as well so um you know i miss that a little bit sometimes too <laughs> i mean yeah it sucks because i my generation didn't really get to do that like you're you're right. born and you just you put the phone in your hand almost right but I mean, in the same way, almost that's too really easy. good. Almost too easy for you guys now. <laughs> that's what, <laughs> honestly, I think that's what the issue is, you know, because it's like I can find whatever the hell I want, like in a snap, in an instant. I got my magic genie with me and right. I can see whatever I want. But is that any fun? Well, I don't know. It, it, you know, you could be the judge of that, but I, it, you know, it's definitely a different, it's a different type of thing. I mean, having to really, um, yeah, I mean it's a different a different type of motivation and a different type of um exp exploration certainly. Um yeah, and like you said, I mean you, you know you have not just not just uh musically but with anything. I mean having having a computer in your hand that you know maybe still has a has perhaps a pretty curated you know uh amount of information with boundaries as far as you know what it might yeah. you search out but yeah, there and there's a lot more um you know a lot more at hand and probably uh, the flip side might be like you said i mean you know italian death metal and you know, there, <laughs> there there might be an opportunity to explore things but uh, you know in in general with a lot of things i think um uh you know bouncing around a little bit and ha certainly having a wide um breadth of knowledge and um experiencing things like that and really finding maybe what inspires you is interesting but with a lot of things in life um at some point i think it's interesting to you know to commit to something or to you know to, to pick something and you know and, and go deep with it you know vertically as opposed to just you know horizontally the whole time so exactly um, you know that was maybe easier to do perhaps i mean it's easy to do now but maybe you were more forced or it was a obvious kind of way to go back when you know back before there were all these all these modern conveniences yeah and what what made you like jump off the deep end was it like a certain point where you were like i want to make people go deaf with my shows and you were like let's let's do this all the way or was it almost like a you know dipping your toes in the water and see if i like it you know it was a, it was a do it all the way i mean that's certainly um you know i read a really you know also years ago but there was an interesting i grew up like i said in minneapolis where the replacements are from and there was an interesting paul westerberg interview that i read one time and i'm you know i'll get the sentiment of it right i'm sure i won't get the exact quotes right but he talked one time about his band and that uh, he never was really interested in being in a band just for the sake of being in a band and that uh you know that if he was going to do it he was really gonna gonna dive all in and go for it and then talked about the idea that um you know even just the idea that he used a baseball analogy as i recall and said that the idea of um you know if it's if it's your time to step up to the plate and here comes the pitch that he said you know he's gonna swing as hard as he can and even if he you know swings and misses there's even there's something very human about you know going for something and even if there's failure and there's connection sort of in that and um no, I was, you know, I was never really interested in being in a band just for the sake of it. And I certainly wasn't interested in doing anything to artificially throttle myself. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, so it was definitely a concerted effort and something, you know, music has been a huge part of my existence my whole life. And I think, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I definitely had this sense also that when, you know, when I did it, I wanted to do it right, you know, and well, the question then of course is well what does right mean and right you know for me meant with uh you know with integrity and also really presenting things that like i said that that felt like um you know that, that i that just that i believed in that, and that that um expressed my you know my synthesis of of what in the world is happening here <laughs> so that's awesome be beautiful um I guess like backstory, by the way, too. That's great. Like, you know, reading interviews is always super interesting and a great source of inspiration. And the uh, abstract or the, uh, what's the word? The external 
kind of push is super interesting what you were talking about. And which brings me to another point, right? Which is LSD and search for God. Would you consider these kind of artificial um, drugs that are certainly the proponents in a lot of different types of music, especially nowadays too, when it's easier to get, you know, um, substances, not, would you consider, would you consider that to be like an external um, source of inspiration or would you consider that to be organic and part of the process? You know, well, it's, you know, in terms of abandoning, there's a whole bunch there, but I, you know, one of the things, you know, I get asked that sometimes and there's an interesting, you know, don't want to repeat myself, but there's a recent interview or same kind of thing. And, you know, one of the many things that went into that, um, besides, you know, right, the, just the idea of exploration and trying to figure out, you know, make meaning of what in the world is going on here and what we're doing here and who we are and all of this, um, also, you know, from a very Shakespearean sort of standpoint of, you know, that a rose by any other name, you know, would smell as sweet and thinking, you know, in some ways, just the whole ridiculousness of a, of a band name or having to put a label on something in the first place. And, um, you know, I, I think I remember being a young kid and, um, not only thinking that the Grateful Dead was a, just a terrible band name, but thinking this is Italian death metal basically, or, you know, something that, uh, and I remember just being completely shocked when I when I heard the music, and it um, uh, also very much then changed my understanding and the meaning of of what those two words together meant in my mind. And um, you know, something even more personal to me was uh, you know, same thing, my bloody Valentine. I mean, I thought that was just a terrible name, and of course, I'm going to hate this music. And um, and also thinking that it was something likely very different than what it was and um of course now when i hear that band name it means something very different than what it probably did when i first heard it and was even resistant to probably even you know thinking i would like the music let alone you know listening to it and um yeah so there's also something somewhat preposterous just about band names and figuring let's you know let's, let's go with it yeah and um it's funny because all the weirdest band names are always the best bands like <laughs> i mean viagra boys psychedelic porn crumpets uh, lsd insert these are all band names that like i can't say in front of my teachers whenever right, i'm exactly. telling like yeah. there's a um my social study teacher is an awesome guy who listens to a lot of weird music and i yeah. can't say these names out loud <laughs> which is but it's it's the you know the weirder the better and especially yeah. with um he just a Mary Chain was the same way for me. I mean, I remember. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I mean, just blasphemous. Uh, right. And it's also interesting to think how, you know, relatively tame of a name that seems now, but also how much it's part of the lexicon at this point, at least in this kind of music. And it's, you know, it's, it's changed the whole, you know, like I said, the understanding of the, the words and the meaning. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and with that uh, follows like the, uh, or I guess like that's happening because of like the, the uh what's it the internet because like mm -hmm. you know you can i can get everything on my phone so i can get terrible stuff on my phone that you know it's like incredibly dehumanizing and you know not moral and mm -hmm. you can get it in an instant which everyone does get in an instant and you know whether you want to see it or not somehow it'll you know fall into your hands and so that may be a reason why you know you, you'll see these um weirder band names getting more popularity which certainly isn't a bad thing because i'd love to see it when my friends are talking about your band or viagra boys or whatever it may be but it is interesting how the internet has played a part in a lot of stuff and probably more than any of us have expected you know it's yeah i think crazy. uh i think you're right do you consider yourself a deadhead uh no <laughs> don't <laughs> no. you don't listen There's to him anymore you know, there's, I never really listened to him a whole lot, but you know, it will even, you know, taking your question somewhat literally, even, I mean, there's, there's not much that I really, I suppose, consider myself in general with, with any kind of labels, but um, yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think that uh, they, that, that band was never something on a personal level that I suppose was, yeah, I mean, it was, it was never something that I would call really like a, uh, like an influence or something like that but i think that there there's a lot about it that i think is amazing and probably some of that stuff that has crept into you know my my musical pathway in ways that i don't understand i i, I liked it was very different new to me when i was uh, at a certain point 
in my life and I was um, interested and curious about it. And I certainly thought the, you know, the bigger picture besides the music, but the whole, right, the whole deadhead thing was very interesting and fascinating to me. Um, you know, but in terms of calling myself or considering myself a deadhead per se, I, you know, that's never been something that I've, yeah, I've never been a card carrying member of the, of the deadheads, but, um, but I have a tremendous amount of respect for, you know, for them and their place in history and, um, their place in music and in all of that. Yeah. It would have been, it would have been super funny to hear like, you know, at the, the most shoegazy band to shoegaze. Mm -hmm. I was influenced by the Grateful Dead. I can just imagine the headlines right now, right? But um, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, but I guess that is interesting, like how this, you, like you, as a musician, you're kind of just an open microphone, and whatever feedback you get, and whatever whatever's playing around you, subconsciously influences you. So, would you see that, like listening back to your music? I guess what was like '90s, 2000s? Do you hear influence from? I guess pop or like whatever was on the radio in your music or is it kind of like so um specialized and so so yourself in way of expression that all that got pushed out you know the way that i sort of think about it is um i mean i suppose individualized or specialized like you're talking about in a way that it's um i mean i i certainly understand the reference and i understand the the genre that we get, you know, lumped into or pushed into or associated with. And, um, you know, and I also understand, you know, in some ways how the thinking mind works and that labels and categories and, um, you know, it's, it's a way of, it's a framework for making sense and navigating the world. But, um, you know, it's never been something I, you know, I never once set out to try to be a shoegaze band or to make shoegaze music per se. Um, you know, that's not to say that I wasn't head over heels about a lot of bands that are also, you know, put in there, but, um, you know, I mean, I think not to draw any other comparisons with us, you know, to them, but I, you know, that they've read plenty, you know, in interesting interviews or things with Kevin Shields talking about, um, you know, being somewhat surprised by the bands that are oftentimes associated with what he's doing. And I think you know, I, I would sort of say the same, that there there are definitely bands that are, I suppose, labeled in a genre similar to us that, um, you know, I, I can I can see it, but I also feel quite differently about, you know, whether we really sound like these bands or things like that. And so, I you know, I, I think it's I'm like, I, you know, our music is specialized, I suppose, in the sense that it's just it's an authentic representation of what, you know, I'm hearing or we're hearing in our head and what we're presenting. But I think um so then to answer your question, I suppose, sure. I mean, conscious or otherwise. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, you know, I feel like we're certainly, um, yeah, you know, receivers and antennas both, you know, projecting and receiving. And, and you know, we're definitely, what we project out, I think, in some ways is a reflection of just what, you know, what what someone's picking up on and perceiving, like I said, in, in conscious and other kinds of ways. And um yeah. And then, you know, from there is our own unique, you know, formula of what, what, what the expression is. Amazing. And um, yeah, it's, it seems to be in like the smaller or I guess lesser known genres, even, you know, shoegaze isn't lesser known, but like the certainly not pop genres, you'll see yeah. that like all these weirdo bands will get clumped together. And I think it's yeah. the same with like pop post punk. Because mm -hmm. you'll have like a, a really low down, relaxed band, almost like a jam band, almost like the Grateful Dead, with someone as crazy as like some big post punk, like Shame, if you've heard of Shame from England, mm -hmm. like a crazy yelling in your face post punk right. band. And right. I guess that is a little bit, you know, weird and, un and unnatural, maybe. But again, <laughs> it it is what it is, right? You know, yeah, and critics, like I said, I, you know, I I think. Uh... On some levels, I mean, even, you know, marketers do that. And I think, like I said, I, I think it's a human instinct that our, you know, our brain, in order to make sense of these things and to have to see patterns and try that, it, you know, and this, of course, can be exploited in all kinds of ways. But um, I think it's a normal mental 
process and times to try to categorize things and try to be able to, you know, make quick judgments and quick assessments and able to, you know, make some sense from a thinking standpoint of, of the world and how to navigate it. And, um, yeah, so putting things in categories and lumping them into boxes and figuring out what they, where they go might be a normal brain activity. Um, you know, and sometimes that's helpful and sometimes that's not. Yep. And um, this is another question. Uh, how loud are your shows? And are you one of the type of musicians that will wear in-ear monitors and really be hooked up to the machine? Or mm -hmm. are you the, the musician that, you know, goes all crazy, like John Dwyer? with no right. no earplugs no nothing and just goes head into the music you know i i personally you know i don't do in-ear monitors um and it's not to say that we wouldn't but i don't i you know i'm averse to them in some ways and i uh and i don't i don't wear earplugs at our shows um been told that i should but uh i don't um and i probably won't and you know in terms of the, the loudness i mean i think uh you know, we're not Valentine's loud, that's for sure. And, you know, for better or for worse. And, and you know, there's, um, I want there, this shows should, you know, I, I'm not looking to harm and injure people. And even I think things like, um, you know, like a place to bury strangers or the Valentine's. I mean, the, I think I can appreciate and understand that there is something that's just simply somatic sometimes at a certain level where you're, you know, your body is resonating with the music and you're feeling something. And I, can really appreciate that and I can really enjoy it. I mean, that's, that's not quite what we're doing. Um, but I don't think that, uh, you know, I, I don't think people should be able to, I mean, if they want to, that's their choice. They can do it elsewhere, but I, you know, I don't want people at the bar hanging out and having conversations and having, I mean, I like the idea that this is, you know, if you're there, this is what you're experiencing. If you're, if you're there for this. Um, so there's, there's a volume aspect to it for sure, but it's not, uh, you know, I don't find it to be overwhelming or necessarily so loud than what, you know, some other type of show might be. Um, yeah. And then from like you said, the technology standpoint, I, I, I do like the idea of, I mean, you may know this, but when, you know, a band is playing, playing, um, you know, we'll have stage monitors and everybody will have somewhat of a different mix, depending on what they want to hear in order for them to be able to you know, play their instrument or sing the way they want and project that. And then um, in the house, you know, it will sound differently depending on, you know, what our sound person's doing and what kind of instructions they have, but also their understanding of the music and their expertise. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in, I mean, in my monitor, depending on where we are, it's, al it's always somewhat different, but typically, um, you know, I'll want my vocals and I'll want my vocals to be really dry so I can hear them and hopefully sing, you know, on key and not have, not have reverb or delay or things and in what I hear, not necessarily not in the house. Um, I'm close enough to my amps that I can pretty typically hear them without needing them in the monitor. Um, you know, and we have a couple great sound people that we work with and um, I trust them enough, not only their, you know, their ability to do their job so well, but also they understand what we're trying to do. And, you know, I trust their ability to, put volume into the house where it needs to be with the guitars. So I don't have to overwhelm myself or anybody else on stage with the volume of our, of my amps on stage, you know, which might be different than how I want it, you know, like I said, in the house for the audience, but um, you know, it's, it's somewhat of the approach that I take to the, the, the technical aspect of a live show. I guess there's a lot of trust in music too then. Right. But that's mm -hmm. really interesting. And one of the quotes, again, I'm not, like you said, I can't memorize quotes and I don't think you can either, but um, this is a really interesting quote by Michael Gira of Swans, yeah. which is like, you know, every night when I'm laying in bed, I have the ocean in my ears <laughs> because of, um, you know, how much beating the ears go. But if it's, if it's for um, a wholesome source and it's for, if it's for an organic, um, I guess objective, you know, and the the source, the source, the objective to create beautiful music. Then, I mean, why not? It's worth it, and I think it is. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, trust. I, I hear the ocean too, but maybe in a different way that he does. I don't, you know, I, I don't. Luckily, you know, at the moment, there's no no tinnitus or any you know abnormal ringing that I have on a typical basis. But um, 
but I hear all kinds of sounds. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> And then are we going to see, uh, going back to the album, are we going to see like weird sounds, maybe synths and stuff on this new record? Or will it be like a typical, like a typical sound of God or search for God record? Um, you know, no, uh, no synths are, I, re you know, I really like the idea of, and we're, you know, this could change at some point, but it won't on this record of, um, you know, I like that we're a guitar band. And I like being able, in a lot of ways, um, you know, another, since we're doing this, you know, quote that I'll get wrong. But, you know, the idea, one thing that really resonated with me, and it's interesting, you know, the uh, the light that's being shed on some of this stuff. But um, in an interview I read ages ago with Scott Cortez of Love Lies Crushing and, you know, Astro Bright and Star. And, um, but, you know, and, and it really this resonated with me but the idea of you know him talking about how he really like looks in a lot of ways at the guitar as a noise generator you know and um yeah there's there's something about both you know the analog as well as digital combination just like you know we are both analog and digital but something about using that medium to get these you know what i would consider sometimes otherworldly sounds or connect with these you know beautiful awe inspiring you know really connected coming from a place of you know who knows where of, of being you know being able to do this with guitars i really there's something about that that's always musically been really interesting to me so i love the idea of um yeah doing that again with this and so um so far there certainly aren't any keyboards and i definitely don't anticipate any um you know we're recording in a studio and you know it's fun to do certain things perhaps sometimes with mixing and um and things like that but no it'll it'll be guitars yeah cool yeah and i mean as a guitarist with a uh i guess a dino junior inspired jazz master it's awesome. sitting over there cool. but um i yeah i like that too with like today i was listening yeah. to sleep dope cool. smoker yep, and yep. Uh, i was just you know i made it set up my thing super loud and just yeah. like really felt the feedback and the yeah. and there's something beautiful about that there's something I agree. um otherworldly of that yeah and it's nice to see you know bands like your band or the band doing it um because you don't see that you know and there's a there's always it's great to have different bands and weirder bands and bands doing you know like black country new road has like horns and stuff mm -hmm. and then there's like a um there's like what's it there's a dude who like plays with like a shard of glass and he like yeah. vibrates yeah yeah and I guess that's cool, but it's also yeah. really cool to be able to do that with your guitar, you know, with the home base. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I think, like I said, the idea of, um, you know, for some people, there's other noise generators that make sense. But like I said, it's it's interesting to think about that as the, you know, the source, like I said, as a, as a tone generator or a noise generator, and then, you know, taking it from there. But, but really, you know, starting with that as, as the, as the medium to get things going is, something that i really enjoy beautiful well um so we've got five minutes and 30 seconds according to zoom it's right been on. a wonderful conversation you're a super interesting guy so i'm gonna give you a loaded question and Go you've got it. five minutes okay <laughs> <laughs> you gotta give me um three songwriters or so three songwriters sing three albums three whatevers it can be whatever category you can either do three of each or you can do one 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 it's mm -hmm. completely up to you. The magic number is three. And the kicker is it's got to be something that could change someone's life for the worst, for the better. Completely up to you. Five minutes, or you got five minutes? Yeah, what an interesting question. Um, you know, there there's an endless list, I think, of uh of all that. And I think ultimately, um, you know, any which is what's so wonderful. I mean, any any bit of music could do that for for a for a person um you know depending on where they are in their journey through this experience and um you know i think um that's a, yeah that's a really interesting question let me think for a second i think uh i mean growing up so you know growing up like i said in minneapolis i mean um Prince is, 
just you know was an incredible and incredibly prolific as a as a songwriter and um you know amazing pop sensibilities and talk about someone who like you said was willing to go all in and um you know i mean he, he, he's someone who's certainly incredible from from all kinds of different ways i think that um you know there was a period of time for me where there was a lot of music that i was turned on to and then that really moved me and then there was a, a period of you know, a gap where i felt sort of you know abandoned sounds maybe too dramatic but um you know being turned on to like i said the valentines and spacemen and um verb at the time before they you know became the verb and um Ooh, Radley, it's more than three, I guess. I'm guess I'm not following your rules per se, but all up to you. You know, a whole, um, you know, which I think are the obvious threads to what what led to, you know, the our music or our sound. But um, yeah, there was a, a real interesting time when, you know, that that stuff certainly changed changed my life and changed my understanding of music, and um, but also at a really pivotal time in my life where, um, like I said, I was you know, looking for all kinds of answers and looking for all kinds of, you know, doing all types of exploration, but really, you know, what moved me, I guess, in, in terms of those kinds of things uh, was finding music that really resonated in a way that felt like exploration was happening. Uh, There's some type of communication with this, you know, type of music that really helped me along the lines of, um, yeah, trying trying to navigate this whole experience and figuring out what I'm doing here, what in the world and who in the world I am, uh, you know, where we fit in this time space continuum and, um, you know, early slow dive stuff. I mean, all, all the things that one might expect, but, um, you know, it maybe felt, uh, and it's also, like I said, putting in context whether this stuff was, you know, brand new. I mean, thinking, um, you know, having no idea how in the world people were making music like this with guitars and um, and even where this vision came from. And then this, you know, collective kind of piece, like you said, before the Internet, before it was really easy to to find all these things. And um, yeah, there was something about that that was really fun to explore on a music and on a sonic level. Um, and it also somehow seemed to match up with. Like I said, the other types of exploration and, and curiosity that I had about life and about me and about the world and um you know i don't know if that really gets to the question that you're asking it does, it it's certainly different, different than a you know the magic number of three <laughs> um, but yeah i mean that, that's that's i mean I'll, so i think yeah there's i mean that kind of music can certainly change someone's life it certainly changed my life but mm -hmm. also like being at a time where um you know, looking to explore and also looking for answers and sort of helping, you know, along the way on the journey. Beautiful. Okay. Incredible answer. Incredible person. It's been an honor. It's been a pleasure. Please, if you ever come to Atlanta, don't come yeah. to the Earl because it's 21 plus and they do not allow me to go to any concerts. Maybe we another venue. Atlanta. We were the, the varsity, right? Is that the, what the Variety Playhouse. Variety Playhouse. Yeah. Heading there for Swans mm -hmm. actually, but um. Awesome. Um, we were it's maybe a year, year, roughly a year or so ago. Well, I hope to see you again. I don't want to get cut off. I don't want to talk over you. But not, I'm going to get cut off by the uh, Zoom. So it's been an honor. It's been a pleasure. Mine, mine as well. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon, okay? Thanks, Jay. Have a good night.